Hello, Saint. You are now listening to the teaching sermon from the God Life Assembly Just by Pastor Chintok Ishako. Remain blessed as you listen. Strengthen our sight in your word. Strengthen our hearts by your word. Speak your truth into us, O God. Cause us to arise by your truth. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Please reach out to two, three, four, five people. Tell them it's good to see you in church. Love upon them. Warmly, warmly, warmly. Warmly receive them to church tonight. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Please take your seats in God's presence. Amen. Um, this is how I feel led to start tonight. Uh, I think we should take questions and answers from, we should take questions from the Prosperity Conference. Does anybody agree? Okay, all right. Pastor Elsie agrees, so, uh, amen. Where are you going to? Amen. Today is Tuesday. Where are you going to? I want to know. Go like this. Like this. You should have mastered the traffic by now. Glory to God. All right. So, I think we should ask questions, all right? Um, if there are areas that you didn't understand, there are things you need clarity on, let me take those questions now. And those of you who are worshiping with us online, you are welcome. You might also want to throw out your question on any of our platforms, whether on YouTube, on Facebook, um, or on Instagram, if you are watching right now. Our media team will send your question here. And we will answer it by the grace of God. Amen? Come on, I said amen. amen. The way you're answering, they'll think I'm alone in church. So amen. amen. Uh-huh. Praise God. So do we have anybody who has a question? You have a question from Prosperity Conference. You have anything that needs clarity. You have anything that needs understanding. So can I see you wave, throw your hands up. Um, just indicate by any godly means. Just not indicate by shooting somebody. Just any godly means. Amen? Okay. Uh, you look like you don't have questions. <laughs> okay. Pastor Ahide has a question. Amen. So Pastor Ahide has a question. Now who is going to answer? <laughs> All right. So, amen. Any other person? Any other person indicate now or forever hold your peace on this matter before people reach home dump. All right, so let's hear you, sir. Let's hear, let's hear your question. All right, good evening, sir. Um, there were two things that were running through my mind yes. during the conference. Um, one was the place, um, the place of vision. You know, that sense of um, something bigger than yourself, you know, in the kingdom of God, that portion in the kingdom of God that we are to pursue. Just to put that in perspective of what was taught. And the second one was the anointing, 
that individual anointing that empowers a man. You know, I just wanted to locate that in the scheme of. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Pastor Rampi has his hand up, so let me add his question to yours, and let's see how God will help us. <laughs> Amen. All right. So I actually am asking this question on behalf of um, so many other people. Yeah. Because when I posted the quotes, this was the particular one that a lot of people were asking, but I needed to ask you too because I think um, it would be good for you to put things in perspective. Yeah. Because anytime we have prosperity, the first thing that comes to our mind is money. Yeah. And I'll prove it from the question that people ask. This was your quote. You said, prosperity is a trust God only gives to those whose souls have prospered. Yeah. And somebody was saying, does it mean that Elon Musk, God, God has trusted Elon Musk more than he trusts him. He even said it's a shameful thing to see that God trusts Elon Musk. Uh -huh, more than he trusts him. So it means that he, God has not trusted him enough as a believer. Uh -huh, you see, so the, that means he's... So the comparison already tells me where his mindset of... Yeah, yes, So yes. I found myself trying to explain the prosperity from the aspect of soteria, nothing missing, nothing broken. Broken, yes. I had to talk about the concept of grace and all that. But I felt it would be better if you explained it for believers. So when we have prosperity convention... You know, and I, I almost wanted to give a sarcastic answer, but I felt, uh, let me be careful <laughs> not to offend anybody, but then, yeah. yeah, so. Okay, praise God. Maybe we should come from the back and come to the front, because I, I think it will help us connect it. All right, so let's start from this question. Um, I am glad that scripture is clear. Okay, let's use Psalm 73, all right? I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Unfortunately, it's Psalm 73. Unfortunately, believers believe that prosperity is prosperity, money is money. I mean, so, and you can't blame the average believer. The average prosperity conference that we have had in churches have used unbelieving examples as examples of prosperity. Now, because people are not able to separate unbelieving examples from the example of the prosperity that comes from God, it then becomes a problem. Because the moment you say that prosperity is a trust that God gives to people whose soul have prospered, the believer is now thinking of the last example you gave him in the last prosperity convention. Why? Because you use that man as an example for prosperity. So if I'd stood here and I'd spoken about Elon Musk or Erimos, like... <laughs> Are you following me? If I'd stood here and spoken about Dangote, if I'd stood here and spoken about anybody else, I don't want to call certain names in Nigeria because the contention is, are they believers? And then people will now put it on YouTube tomorrow, our Pastor Tinto castigates so-so person's wealth and calls him not a believer. Unfortunately, um, what people don't see is that, like we did the illustration with the chair here, there are two pathways to prosper. I call Psalm 73. Media, I'm waiting for you. Verse 1. All right? Um... People don't understand that the prosperity of the wicked is different from the prosperity of the righteous. And the wicked does not have to look wicked to be wicked. That the guy's wearing t-shirt and jeans does not mean that it was God who entrusted his prosperity to him. David started in Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel, even to those who are pure in heart. Then he said, but as for me, verse 2, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Verse 3, which was the verse I quoted. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the... Oh! So there is what is called the prosperity of the wicked. And the foundation for the prosperity of the wicked, Matthew chapter 4, is that Satan looked at Jesus the Christ and said to him, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things because they have been given to me. 
that means just like God can prosper a man, Satan can prosper a man. So money in the hands of every man is not a trust. We are talking about the prosperity of the believer. And if we don't bring it within the context of being a believer, then anybody else can become an example. So Jesus said to Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall be careful to med med meditate upon it day and night. Then shall you make your way prosperous, and then shall you have good success. That means anybody whose prosperity does not come from meditating on the word of God cannot be said to be the prosperity of the righteous. Very simple. But like we accepted in one of the illustrations I gave during the prosperity conference, the seat of the rulership of the earth responds to seven things. Right? I alluded to that on Saturday. And I tried to teach that explicitly on Sunday. And I'm going to take the time and slow down today because many of you, the way I look at me, you, you are pretending that you understand what I taught on Sunday. You don't. So I decided that when I come today, I will slow down and explain it bit by bit so that you can get it. All right? So, but I said that to say this, whatever has prosperity is not drawn out of the principles of scripture and does not come by reason of a relationship with God is not the prosperity we are speaking about and the Bible calls it, it calls the prosperity of the word good success. That means there can be bad success. Alright? And bad success is not failure. Bad success is a success whose foundation and destination does not glorify God. Are you following me? So, when we speak about wealth, like I said, you can't blame them. That was what I meant on Sunday when I said, part of my joys with this prosperity conference was that there was no covetousness anywhere. If you had mixed it with covetousness, and, and sincerely it's my prayer for the body of Christ, I know many people who believe in us in this city whose disappointment was that even Pastor Chintok is hosting Prosperity Conference. I'm, I'm telling you. They are disappointed. They are disappointed that Pastor Chintok is becoming a money preacher. Unfortunately, if it's a subject in scripture, we can't avoid it. But you would have given Pastor Chintok the benefit of doubt to come and hear what he believes concerning it. Because for instance, like I said, you can't blame them. Most of what is taught as prosperity in the body of Christ has its reference to the same principles that these people used to prosper. And mm, let me go back to the trouble finally. One of the first things Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, or one of the clear things Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 is after these things do the Gentiles seek. That means if you find yourself seeking the way the Gentiles seek and what the Gentiles seek, that principle couldn't have come from God. Are you following me? My joy in the entire conference was that everything was kingdom-centered. And because it was kingdom-centered, the source is kingdom-centered, the maintenance is kingdom-centered, the release of it is kingdom-centered, so it makes that you cannot fault prosperity at that level. Are you following me? So, three scriptures now. I've used this one. That's Psalm 73. I've quoted Joshua chapter 1 to say to you, then shall you make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. That means prosperity is based on the word of God. If I cannot arrive and say it was by God that I arrived at stewarding such wealth. 
if it is by the same principles the unbelievers did, which is the third scripture I quoted in Matthew chapter 6, if it's by the same principles, then we're not even talking about the same thing. But they touched something. Because whether good success or bad success, whether Christian money or other money, whether Bible prosperity or outside prosperity, it is still a trust. The problem is that the truster is not always God. Mm. Tell them I said so. That there's nobody who is in custody of resource that does not have his knee bowed to a particular God. Let me tell you, all gods, including Jehovah, will leave you at the level of laymen until they look at you and they can trust you. Listen to this. I'm sure you have heard about blood money. The kind of blood money they make in your village. Let me tell you the truth. Nobody uses blood to make money. What you use blood to do is you use blood to say conscience. <laughs> so, there's no blood money anywhere. Even the blood of Jesus Christ, not for money. <laughs> Let me touch this. Sorry, sorry. Forgive me, forgive me. I didn't need to go there, but I touched it. What I'm saying is that you can speak about it within the context of redemption to say, okay, because Christ has redeemed us, we now have access to the Father and by accessing the throne of grace, one dimension of grace, obviously, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is money. So when we get to the throne of grace, we find the, in Reverend Tendis words, wisdom to prosper. All right? But there's no blood money anywhere. Are you following me? What blood is used to do is not to produce money. What blood is used to do is, is used to say a conscience. So what Satan does by giving people blood money is that he wants your conscience in exchange for influence. Because if he can get you to kill a close relative to make money, he is too sure of what that money will do. He is too sure of the agenda that money will sponsor. So the wisdom behind it is very simple. All of those rituals people make to arrive at wealth is not what gives them the wealth. The wealth is already in custody of the God of this world. Because the God of this world looked at the Son of God and said to him, because I am still the God of this world, I have what it takes to give it to you. And he still does have it. But for him to give it to you, because he knows that eternity is planted in the hearts of all men, the Bible said, and this is the light that lightens every man that comes into the world. That means that there's a deposit of God resident in every man. So Satan cannot trust a normal man to not consider God at some point. Do you understand it? And because he cannot trust a normal man to not at some point consider God, he wants to be sure. That if he releases resources in your hand, what the resources will serve and service for all of its days must be an agenda that comes from him. So there's no printing press that requires money, that requires blood to print money. Do you understand it? Now, that we said to establish this, that all wealth is a trust. That means when you approach a wealthy man, the question you should be asking is, who trusted this man? And if you establish that the trust that that man is holding is not from God, then one of the things that is required from you is the consecration that says, I will not eat the meat that is on this table. Do you now understand the wisdom of Daniel? So when they said food sacrificed to idols, he wasn't just talking about, of course, God had a recommended list of foods 
that Israelites should not eat. But it wasn't just talking about the pig and the... Mm -mm. It was not dirty meat. It was which God this food was dedicated to. Because it is an acknowledgement that it is that God that produced the resource from which this table is served. That's why Daniel lived to turn that table until the king can say, let no God be worshipped in Babylon except the God of Daniel. That then means that the next time they stood in front of a table to eat, when they lifted up their hands, they were dedicating the food to the God of Daniel. Those are the things we live to see. That's also part of the reasons why God must give you contentment before he sets you before kings. Do you understand it? That's why when you come to sit to eat with kings, the Bible recommends that you put a knife to your throat. The king needs to know. Listen, it's an unspoken language, but you must speak it. The king needs to know, I consider more myself here to help you than I consider myself here to live by your largesse. Unspoken. Because if you say it, it can provoke a king. But the way you carry yourself around the king tells him that you came content. And you don't only do contentment as a show of pride, you do contentment as a sore target. Because when a king sees a man who is content, who is looking for nothing, the king knows that this man can be depended on in the seasons of great need. And if you ask me sincerely, that's the line where the body of Christ have seemed to miss it. So let's hop into Pastor Hede's question. Listen to this. It is because of that sense of dependence on a God that makes that when gods engage you, hear this, they don't give you an assignment that is your size. Why? It's very simple. Number one, it elicits dependence. Number two, it sends glory to the God. Uh -huh. So what it does in an evil sense, now please hold this in an evil sense. I mean, you will see I place in the righteous sense. What it does in an evil sense is that it brings the entire village to the fear that if we stop servicing our altar with this God, this goodness will stop coming to us. Now, if it's a goodness they can handle, they can afford to change gods. You see, that's why the Bible says that because they, did, they failed to retain God in their consciousness, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, right? Um, one thing scripture said about Israel in 1 Corinthians 10 was that they became unthankful. And what unthankfulness does to the average believer is that it begins to commonize the things that only the hand of God could have done that have happened in or around your life. So what happened, for instance, with Israel is that they saw manna every day, but they did not, they were not in awe by day 10, like they were in awe by day 1. Do you get it? Now, the, the culture of thanksgiving was given to the believer to consistently keep the believer in awe. So that by the recitation of the goodness of God, you never commonize what God does around you, in you, or through you. Does it make sense to you? So for instance, um, Peter, you can finish a crusade and be say, oh God, there were 10,000 sick people. Only 10 people were healed. Oh, let me ask you, what did you bring to the crusade that had the capacity to heal 10? Someone didn't, someone didn't get me. The 10 people that were healed, was it drugs you gave them? What was inside your hand that made that you can touch a person and his health status will change? You see, you, you were not thankful for the 10 that were healed and you are beginning to lose all of the fact that the one who does this mighty thing, I cannot even explain by what technology my hand touches a person and the person receives strength. So, because it was 10 people who were healed in the crusade, you would return angry and forget to be thankful 
Why? Because you have begun to commonize the things that you cannot explain. Uh -huh. So what gods do to keep you in awe is that they enlarge your experience so that they can enlarge your expectation. Oh, I wish you heard me. What gods do to keep you in awe is that they enlarge your experience so that they can end. Now, what, what, what Satan does is that he enlarges your fear. That's why God does his thing simply and walks away. When Satan does a thing for you, he will tie it to your great-grandfather. Do you realize that Satan will never give a man something until he has tied it to something? What you do you understand it? In no culture, in every culture, there's no gift that Satan gives for free. It is God who gives you a gift for free and walks away waiting for your brain to boot. Because if your brain boots, you will actually pursue God and hold him by the skirt of his garment. But God is willing to walk away forever and your brain does not boot forever. Does it make sense? Because in the words of Bishop Oedipo, if you can think, you can tank. Yes. And thanksgiving comes out from the acknowledgement that my experience and the things that God does through me are bigger than what I can explain. There is a force in my hands that make that when I touch you, you are blessed. Do you understand it? So you know, those songs we sing, anyone I touch, we, we started to think of it as commonly. That's part of the reasons why most times when we even enter into trouble, the first thing Satan does is he takes away our eyes from the mighty things that God has done. And it happens to every man, including Elijah. So look at this. There's the sense first. Please follow me. There are three things I'm going to say on that first question that Pastor Ahidi said. There's a sense first of keeping you dependent and in awe. Are you following me? There's that sense. It is that sense of dependence and awe that makes that every time God shows up, when he wants to give you an assignment, he gives you an assignment bigger than you. Now, hear this. But the second thing is what Reverend Tende was teaching when he spoke about God making you to give you. Of course, I've said that for many years. Now, the only way to make anybody is to move them out of their comfort zone. So, your child's muscles will literally atrify if all he's still carrying is the same bucket you used to give him 20 years ago. So what you do is that you keep increasing the challenge so that the child also begins to find out the godship that is in him. I shift, I shift that from human analogy into divine analogy. And I hope you got it. Alright? Thank you. Thank you, sir. How good. Look at this. That's the second thing you must see. Why does God always seem to give us things that are bigger than us? The reason is because together with the fall came a limitation as to the truth of our capacity and God is looking at us and he knows how deep our belly is listen how many of you were here when I thought belly for belly when I thought belly for belly I told you that every man good or evil has the capacity that in the flesh your belly is as deep as hell the Bible even records it like that. That's why your fleshly appetites are never ever satisfied. That's why a man can become a gluten and the man is becoming obese, but he cannot help it. He keeps eating. And the capacity of what he eats is enlarging every day together with the size of his body. What your belly is telling you is that if you leave me, I can enlarge to be as large as hell. But then Jesus also stood in John 7 and he said, as many as believe in me, as the scripture has said, out of their belly 
shall flow rivers of living waters. Then he said, and this speaky concerning the Holy Spirit, Pastor Chintok's paraphrase, and all his possibilities, that them that believe shall afterward receive. Because when you say, this speaky concerning the Holy Spirit, all a believer is hearing is the passing of the Spirit. No, what the person of the Spirit comes to do, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is that he provokes the possibilities in your own spirit. Now, so I have a belly that can be as deep as containing God. Mm. The unbeliever has a belly that is as deep as can contain hell. The problem is that the average believer does not know the extent of his Godship. So the only thing the Holy Ghost can do is he starts to set assignments in front of you that are always bigger than you. Because, listen to this, the good thing about faith is that if you follow the word process of faith, when you actually achieve faith, you don't draw back. Oh, because drawing back, Hebrews chapter 10, is perdition. That means, if I get faith today for 10 million, God does not expect that 10 million is a subject of discussion anymore. Listen, there is the faith to attain, there is the faith to sustain. It is the faith to sustain that scripture refers to when it says the just shall live by faith. But the faith to attain is the faith scripture referred to in Hebrews chapter 11 when he said, who through faith subdued mountains. Now, when you hear subdue mountains, if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain. Now what he's saying is that this is not a thing that is common for men to do. Are you following me? And even you, when you stood in front of it, it didn't look common to do. But you exercised yourself in the speakings of God, in the knowledge of the principles of God, until your heart accepted that you could do it. Then you took the step. Now, the moment you take this step, the step you have taken, come, 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 darling. I've not told you yet. The moment, stay there. The moment you took the step from here to here, right? Everything behind here is where you live. So when the Bible says the just shall live by faith, it is speaking about the fact that every realm the believer has conquered becomes a normal lifestyle for him. So any day you wake him up, he can heal the sick because he has healed the sick. John Sandy. So if he raised the dead, the first day he raised the dead will be the mistake Satan made. Do you understand what I mean? Because from the first day he raised the dead, the realm of raising the dead becomes where he lives. Are you following me? After death, after that, that time, when he looks at death, it's a common place. There has to now be a challenge higher than death that will challenge him. Do you get it? So in that journey of faith, it becomes important for God to constructively, according as your faith can bear. If you understand what I mean. You know when he spoke about talents and he said he gave to one, two, and he gave to one, five, and he gave to one, one, each according to their several capacities. That's what I'm speaking about now. When I say according to your level of faith. If you can believe for a leap from here to there, God will not reduce your steps. Do you get it? Naturally, it is expected that people can move from 500 naira to maybe 1.5 so that they now get used to still holding 1.5. Then they move from there to like 20,000. Then they now get used to still holding 20,000. Then they move from there to 100,000. Let me tell you, there are clear stories in scripture of people whose fortunes God changed in one night. It then means that God can trust a man to be able to take that leap. But you know what? Normally, the limitation of the size of your leap is the size of your believing. 
Because what God is actually dealing with in enlarging the size of your assignment is the size of your believing. Now, culture shock can kill some people if God moves them at the pace he wants to move them. Do, do, do you understand what I mean? There are certain changes that if they happen to your life, the problem will be how you will address it. You have heard stories now of people's first one million. Do you understand? Have you, if you have ever been around your first one million, especially if you got it cash, tap it. That day you won't sleep. Even now, self dicing a lot. You will check the alert like six times that night. To, is this still there? Then you hide your phone. That day you are not chatting, you are not browsing. You are thinking somebody will borrow your phone and they will be able to. You have forgotten that there's fingerprints that enters your. The problem is that as at that point, your heart cannot contain one million. One million feels like the word everlasting in scripture. Do you know, you, when you just think I have one million, what you are thinking is everlasting. Like, this is eternal. You are thinking from now to the next 70, 80 years, I have money. What you don't know is that this one million. The real problem is that I used to two two K balance. So normally. The size of the steps of your change are according to what your heart can take in transition. Do you understand it? And I'm not saying that you should go and lie down today and say, God, if you send me one billion now, all I do, eh? then you now realize that your head has jammed. Because in all your imagination, you have never imagined a function for one billion. The kind of land I want to buy in Abuja, one billion can buy it. So if you give me one billion now, there are things to do. Are you following me? And I still believe in the favor of God. No, 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 I know. I've already seen a structure for the church in Abuja. I've seen it. Because there are certain contentions we need to take to that gate. There are some contentions we need to take to that gate. And you can't enter that gate commonly. Do you understand it? Don't tell Pastor Elisha I said this. He can manage that venue. I cannot. The capacity of what I need to do if I walk into that city, that venue can't take it. So if you give me one billion today, am I confused? See, it won't last six hours. I'm not joking. It will not last six hours in my account. It won't last six hours in my account. So if I tell you now that I'm believing God for two billion, you can rest. Don't copy my faith. First be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because by reason of the capacity of everything you have done, if anything reaches 10 million, your brain will knock. Do you understand it? Because everything you have thought you ever needed, even if you thought to buy land, you just think if I get 1.2 million now, I'll, buy, I'll go to outside town. Then about those 600,000 hour plot, then I will just raise the foundation. Then I'll be using my salary to complete the house. That's all you are thinking. But scripture said, and God is able to make all grace. That means the limitation is not what God is able to do. The limitation is how much you are able to take. Say that 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Abi. How did Ephesians chapter 3 close? What did he say? Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all 
that you can ever ask or think. Then he said, but he only does it according to the power that is at work in you. That means the amount of power you have been able to activate is the limitation he has as to how much he will do through you. Do you get it? How do you activate the power? Okay, well, come there. Come there. Do you understand it? There is nothing he cannot do. There is nothing he cannot give. In fact, he's excited about giving. Set up, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to see the kingdom in your control. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. You sit in Psalm 112. You hear the delight with which God, scripture said he has dispersed to the poor. He has distributed abroad his righteousness and it's, it's almost an excitement for God to see resources in your hands because of what you will do with resources. Let me say something I'm sure you have heard before because I've taught it again and again. Every attempt in the temptation of Satan was to get Jesus to mobilize the use of the grace of God and his anointing for his personal advantage. And every time Satan did it, every time Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus resisted the temptation and did not create even an alternative for it. The Bible didn't consider it worthy of record as to where Jesus finally got food to satisfy the hunger that Satan used to tempt him. No, God didn't even consider it worthy of, let's see that I will write it, so that they know that after he left the wilderness, so he actually still found something to eat. So you don't attribute it to anything Satan said around him. Do you realize that after that hunger test, Satan took him on for two more tests. That means Jesus suspended the possibility of thinking about that hunger so that Satan will not remotely suggest. Do, do you understand me? But every time Jesus saw a need, everything reasonability did to make him not meet the need, he just laughed over it. He was the one who was even joking with them. Said, ah, where are we going to get food now that will feed all these people? Hmm. Judah said, I beg you, you people, please. Nobody's come near me. I'm sure Judas explained some of his displeasure there. Everybody that can give us money, Jesus is driving them away. Now, anything we collect, the whole month, all the money we collect in the whole month will not feed these people once. The Bible says what Jesus did, he tempting them because he knew what he was going to do. Do you understand it? No day he saw a need. Kai. No day he saw a need that he walked past. That means God knew that resource or the anointing in the hands of Jesus was going to be used to meet the need of others. Is it not a fearful thing that a man who could do that got to Samaria and he was hungry and he gave his disciples money to go and buy bread? Oh, no, 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 no. no. Uh -uh. You have that kind of power available to you. Then you arrive Samaria. I say, guys, guy, hunger did is down. Boy, you guys are big. Go and buy us bread. Do that. Carry the purse with you. So they went there. They didn't buy one bread and bring it for him to multiply it for 13 of them to eat. If you know it, you will know that you are never anointed for you. You can't even know it and become proud. You are never anointed for you. And that's what ex excites God. That's actually what we call a trust. It's at that point that God begins to trust you. 
because he knows. They say, this one, anybody who wants to give it to, the person can come, you collect it from them. That's what we call a trust. Now, so, if you understand that, you've now seen the second reason why God gives you assignments that are larger than you. Because it is in the exercise of that that you strengthen your faith muscles. And every, do you understand? Anybody who does weightlifting knows it. Right? The day you conquer 250 kilograms, the day you conquer it, okay, 250 is normally plenty. The day you conquer 120 kilograms in weight, 120 literally becomes normal. All you need to do is sustain 120. Ooh, let me teach you wisdom now. It's part of the reasons why when Satan realizes that you have conquered, he leaves you for a season. I wish you heard me. Because the only way he can tempt you at that capacity again is that you have not exercised yourself. Because the only way you can lose the ability to, lose, to lift 120 kilograms is if you leave the gym for a long time. But if you have lifted 120 kilograms, if you come back tomorrow, you will lift it again. Mm. You will learn spiritual wisdom now. That means, for whatever I have conquered, I must keep a practice of conquering. Mm. See, if you conquered stinginess by an instruction of the Spirit, make a custom of giving that will make sure that that attitude does not return. The custom is not normally an instruction. It's an exercise. Aya. Aya. So there are certain things that start in your life as instructions. You see that 100,000? Take 30,000 and give it. Jesus! We will not die now! Oh, I'm glad Reverend Tende said. It was actually in my heart that day. It's amazing how big 30,000 is as of how small it is when you go to the market. Are you following me? So God says to you, give that 30,000. You gave it. He comes back again and tells you, give another 30,000. Next month, you gave. Listen, if you have sense, make a covenant of giving 30,000. Ayah. Hey. Make, don't wait for an instruction going forward. Do you understand it? Now, sometimes, that's where people, people don't understand what covenant givings are. It was on Sunday when I went in, they were speaking. I said, ah! We did not teach the difference between giving by instruction and giving because we are in covenant. Listen. In Acts of the Apostles, the giving that was done there was covenant giving. It was not instruction giving. Ah, yeah. So each member of the church did not wait for the Holy Ghost to say to them, take all that you have. It is that they had been taught covenant to the degree to which the pastor can stand up and say, in this our spiritual community, everybody submits his salary to the degree that Ananias and Sapphira died for not submitting it. Uh -huh. I have said too many times that if that was actually a standard matter, then we are, we are in a failure. But it was not actually a standard matter. It was a growth measure. And in covenant givings, like Malachi chapter 3 spoke about, what he said is that they may be meet where? In my house. That means there must be a house that you know as the house of God. When you arrive at covenant giving, most of your covenant giving is actually bound around the house from which you are fed. Eh. Sorry. I'm the pastor of this house, so it will be difficult for you to understand it. See, it's one thing God says to me, take this 30,000, take it to that church, give it to the pastor as he need. That's instruction. Eh? When I get up by covenant and I say I'm going to give 30%, the first thing to think about is the house in which
I do covenant givings. And the essence of covenant givings is to keep my muscles exercised. So the next time Satan wants to tempt me, we cannot be discussing 50,000 now. Are you following? If Satan leaves you for a season, the idea, what temptation didn't he try Jesus at the beginning? He tried the loss of the flesh, didn't work. Tried the loss of the eyes, it did not work. Tried the pride of life, it did not work. So what else is left in Satan's arsenal? No, answer me now. What is left? Nothing. So the Bible says Satan left him for a season. What was he hoping? Say he was hoping that Jesus would not exercise himself in overcoming these things. So by the time we come back the next time, the last time he lifted 120 kilograms, by the time we come back, he should be lifting 80. No, Satan has no new trick. He has exhausted all his tricks. So if he's going to come to you, that's why he has to wait for a season when you are there are some seasons that demons are telling Satan let's go and try and say ah okay, no not now guys in form no have you not noticed that many times for Satan to enter into you he has to take away your joy yeah. he has to bring you to the place where you are discouraged where you are distressed, where you are beginning to question the love of God, the peace of God, the joy. When you arrive there, ah, Satan attaches a demon to your ear. Then you hear the speakings multiplied as to how God has not been fed to you. Kai, oh boy, life has been bad though. And he said to Satan, God is good, God is good, God is good. He said, yes, to others, to others, to others. Say that, I say, come, let me go and show you where God is good. See, God is good here. Kagachan, God is good. Kagachan, God is good. But here, if God is good like this, well, I don't want God. Satan said it mockingly. What you thought is that you were the one who said it. There are days where you are informed. Do you now understand what Jesus meant by watch and pray? That you do not fall into. In the days of your watching and your prayer, even Satan knows that you are informed. That's why when Jesus knew that the prince of this world was coming, what did he do? He just heightened prayer. He just heightened prayer. The prince of this world is coming. Listen, the death of Jesus was designed by the Father, but had to be executed by Satan. And in Satan executing it, Jesus knew that there will be too many traps he can fall into and damage the will of the Father. So long before he came, he started to pray. Then he woke his disciples up. Guys, please, let's go and pray. You guys pray with me. But because the burden was not rested with them, they could not sustain prayer. But he saw what was coming. By the third hour, the Bible said that when he came, he woke them up. He said, sleep on now. How do you wake a person by telling them sleep on? That means you have done your worst. The energy I wanted from you, I didn't get sleep. Let me cook my go and face my matter alone. Are you following me? Yes, sir. Find realms of exercise. In fact, in those realms of exercise are the things you call consecrations. Now, hear me. That's me suggesting that your consecrations need to shift. Do you get my point? Yes. Eh? Yes. Peter, I was doing all right. I like to hug sisters. I like to greet them carelessly. All of that. Until I entered one season of my life. You understand it? Then Satan sent one bullet that I dodged like this. When I come out from dodging that bullet, I will not go back to you. Hey! hey no, 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 no. I now realize that there's a consecration needed. That the things I took for granted before, I can't take for granted anymore. 
Some levels of closeness I let before. I can't let it anymore. Because it is that. I saw how Satan took advantage. Do you understand it? And because that is what Satan took advantage of. I now have to wake up. And certain defenses around me. They become my consecration. Ah, Peter, I have become a little more stoic now. You used to be freer than this. Okay? The price of freedom is what I don't want to pay. Don't lie. Because in no freedom, Satan will use to kill me. If I don't master this realm of freedom, I'm not going to be free again. No. Why? Because in my resisting sin, I have not resisted to the point of... That means, let me, let me say the way it will make you mad. That means, if I realize that I need to... And carry this off. So that this thing can come out. Is it not Jesus that say, if your eye will cause you to see, you will cause it out. Why are all of us having to twice? No, I answered a silly person who would think that I'm saying you should slit your throat. Your... Uh, that's what I just did. I just answered the person who is silly in their minds. Pastor, balance that, you know, before we start cutting out. When Jesus said you should cut your hand, did he balance it? Why are we all walking around with two, two hands? You don't balance your own by yourself. Let your brain not balance it for you. Go and cut yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I'm saying scripture is clear about the fact that no cost is too high when you arrive at a consecration. Eh? Fali? They say this is the door that Satan used to enter that last time that you almost fell. Or that you fell, fell, and God by his mercy lifted. Then you now saw the door again. Then you are going to read. Eh, Wallah, you did not fall. You want to die. You will not near that door until you have gained mastery. Mm. You have to have analyzed what, how many things did I do wrong? What did I underestimate? Because, ah, uh, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil cometh like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We emphasize like, but we do not emphasize devour. No, no, do you understand this? When we taught it, we said, he's not a lion. He's like a lion. Uh, but he divorced. Do you understand it? However it is that he divorced, he divorced. If he divorced like a cat, he divorced. If he divorced like a snake, he divorced. Let us say he's not a lion. Yes, but he divorced. But the Bible tells you that sobriety and vigilance will overtake him every time. That means if I see that Satan has chopped my intestines, if Jesus managed to escape with me and heal me, the next time I'm approaching that place, I'll be asking what dimensions of sobriety or sobriety and what dimensions of vigilance did I lose? They cannot see me coming again like that to that same place. It's foolishness. I said it to say this. Every level you conquer in any aspect of your faith, including your finance, leave consecrations there that consistently remind you. Do you understand it? When we were spiritual children, we were counseled and we were counseled right that this is the New Testament. And the New Testament, our subject is not tithes. We can't be discussing 10%. But guess what people used it to do? Uh -huh. They used it to be the Lord over their lives. They'll tell you, ah, there's no month I don't use more than tithes for God. But the problem is that you are not in covenant anywhere. So what we exercised ourselves in first was that we started by giving tight. Then we lifted it to 15%. Then 20%. Then 25%. Then 30%. We did it as a matter of covenant. John Sandy. And when we exercised as a matter of covenant, we were saying to Satan, take note, there's nothing God gives us that we cannot give. We have to arrive at some level of mastery in that 30%. Then when you arrive there, you could now say, hey, 
Now let's exercise ourselves in faith. People believe they have overcome a place. They don't leave a stone to raise an altar. I, oh, I wish you heard what I just said. In the Old Testament, everywhere a man met God, he left stones and raised an altar so that any day he's passing there, he remembers, this is where I met with God. Are you following me? So you can't overcome a financial level. You overcome it and keep overcoming it. I didn't... Listen, when I gave my first million, nobody psyched me. It's not... I didn't come out from a... a prosperity convention. I didn't come out from somewhere where somebody told me, you want to enter the million realm, you must give the million seed. When I tried that one, the seed never grew. Died on the ground. My wife is laughing. She knows where I took it. Well, like the seed died. Yamutu. Tap. He told us in seven days. Seven days. Ah, ah. We sold things. And we brought the offering. The offering had a number attached to it. So we brought the offering. Ah. All of us came out to the front. The amount of money they gathered in that place that day. <laughs> you understand? And my problem is that they will tell you this seed is tied to seven or this seed is tied to nine. But they will not take 900 or 99. <laughs> All the nine has to start from 9,000. Fair enough. I took 9,000, 90,000, 9 million. Those of us were waiting with 900. <laughs> Just shake my hand and drop it. Shake my hand. <laughs> we gave our seed. We we're waiting for harvest. <laughs> we don't know that the seed had rotting in the ground. <laughs> we learned it that way. I mean, I woke up this morning. I got two unprovoked testimonies from Prosperity Convention. People who gave on Sunday and received on Monday. And we didn't, did anybody promise you that if you give now? What? What's our business promising you? The one who promised you, he wrote it in the Bible. He wrote it there. Unprovoked testimony. I didn't call them to say, has anything happened in your life? We were discussing all that things. Then said, Daddy, let me share a testimony with you. Two of them, same things they said. Daddy, let me share a testimony with you. I thank God that I did not stand up to say, if you sow 2K today, good measure, 20K. Press down, 200K. <laughs> Run <it> over, 2 million. <laughs> uh, I sold you mathematical formula. Are you following? We gave that seed. Oh, come on. Any day I remember that seed. And I went somewhere not too long ago. I met the same person that collected the seed. And he was preaching the same message. I wanted to get up and say, hey, hey, hey. Covetousness is a devil. Covetousness. Covetousness. So let, let me run out of Pastor Hide's uh, question like this. Guys, every time God says something larger than you in front of you, enter into it. When you enter into it, you have conquered it forever. But you must exercise yourself in it from time to time. Do you understand it? So when you hear us say, we got up and we decluttered. We got up. There are seasons I wake up and I look at my account and I feel like being good. No, not because I have too much. Not because I heard a voice saying, ah, Chintok, Carl Habaka, you have this thing. People are suffering around you. No, no. God does not have to blackmail you to take an offering from you. No, no, no. He doesn't. 
I wake up in certain seasons and I feel like doing good. Do you understand it? So I get up and I say, okay, everybody in my office will take care of this one. Everybody around me will collect this thing. What are we doing? That one did not come because it, the Holy Ghost woke you up in the night. It came because you are exercising yourself in a cult. Last time we were in London, we were buying a few things for our children. I told my wife, I said, when we come back, we will buy things for this person, that person, this person, that, that, that. I, I listed the people. I sat down in my office today. I started ordering it. Nobody told me. The Holy Ghost did wake me up in the night. Do you understand it? Come on. Do you understand it? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor his righteousness. Endures forever. Every time in scripture they say his righteousness remains forever. It is talking about God. Then in Psalm 112 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He looks at you. And says, when you distribute like that, your righteousness endures forever. That means when you conquer a realm financially, don't go back. Are you following me? Yes, sir. It don't go back. If you start to feed the guards in your house, let nothing stop it. Do it and conquer it. Do not understand it? If you wake up and you decide, every month I'll add 10K from my salary to all of the people who work with me. Don't ever go back. That one, you don't need the voice of the spirit in that sense. Do you understand it? You don't need to hear God wake you up in the night for that one. There are certain things that you do to establish that you have passed certain realms. Wake up one day and say to yourself, if it's food, if anybody's hungry, except if I don't hear it, I'll buy them food. Then you know you have conquered that one. Do, do you get it? Yes. Uh -huh. Let me say this to you. And this is what's called the bowels of compassion in believers. Listen, when a believer attains a financial realm, hear this carefully, he is willing to do the voice of God in that season only shows up when it's necessary to restrain him. Do you understand it? That's what's called bowels of compassion in scripture. Do you get it? There's a day you should get up and say to yourself, you know what? I'll take a portion of Angwarogo. I'll feed them every day. Do you, do you understand? Did you see how I did it? What you're actually saying is that my present financial capacity, if I do this one constantly, it won't stop. I give you a testimony. It's not my testimony. Testimony of one of my daughters. Walked into my office. I said, sir, I've been doing this for this person and this for that person and this for this person and this for that person. What, what do you think I'm not getting right? I said, ah! I've been thinking how to improve this, improve this, improve this, improve that. Then he said to me, Sir, is this how much this person earns? And that person earns? And that person earns? I said, Yes. Sir, I can handle it. I'll pay their salaries every month. And some of them don't even know that somebody that's paying their salaries because the person is not sending it. Do you understand it? That's how to be wealthy. You would rather be doing that than wake up one day and the Holy Ghost says to you, the season for this has ended. Send this money there. Then you know you were restrained. So the bowels of compassion keeps the believer in a consistent place of desiring to do good. Do you realize now why scripture said, do not be weary in well-doing. He said, for in due season, you will reap. I'm looking for the last sentence. Eh? If, you faint. if you faint not. 
That means there are certain things that God will leave for you to do consistently. There are certain covenant cultures you must keep consistently. I have some sons. They earn far less than me. But every month, they send 2K. Those are my urgent 2K guys. No joke. Far less. They send 2K. Every month. Then you see a text following. Pastor, please, recharge card for this month. It tells you you get, excuse me, please look at me. Do I need 2,000? For what? But it tells you that the person is so, sorry, sorry. That's not a suggestion that you should also send me 2K. Just make sure you find your place of exercise and stay there. As God improves you, improve your exercise. Do you understand it? I can't, be, I can't be doing the exercise I used to do when I earned 50,000 now that I'm earning 5 million. Do you get it? I turn in a particular direction. Then I can see what God needs me to do and how much he wants me. Uh -huh. So this is why I take care of it. Amen. Let me advance into teaching the things that I thought I was going to teach today. Okay, my wife asked a question. Have you? Eh? You asked a question. Ask your husband at home. <laughs> Are you following me? So she asked, What is the power? How do you activate the power that works in you? Or Philippians 2, I believe verse 13 that said, it is God who is at work in you, right? Is it 2 13? No. Is it 2 13? Eh? It's God who is at work in you. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you, but to will. And to find that scripture for me. It's Philippians chapter 2. I think that one I'm sure of. It's the verse 11, 12, there about. 2 13. Kai. Let's say I pass Bible small. Proverbs 12. Philippians 2 12. 12, 12. Philippians 2 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, uh huh, walk out your own salvation with. Fear and trembling, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, two dimensions, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, how do I activate the power that is at work in me? First thing scripture suggests in Philippians 2 12 is obedience. Right? As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence. But now, much more in my absence. Then he said, walk out your salvation. Now, it is like scripture saying in 2 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, from verse 5. Wherefore, giving all diligence, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence to add to your faith, what? Virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. Now, listen to this. Every dimension of God that you activate inside of you. Now, I read Philippians 2 to establish with you that it is God who is at work in you. So the power that is at work in you is actually God. How do you activate? By conscious additions. Listen, every dimension of God that you activate inside of you, if God decides to have mercy upon you, the first thing he does is that he shows you the working 
of that power and causes you to desire it. Don't forget, it is God who is at work in you both to will. Now, that means that every Christian has the guarantee of the willingness by reason of the mercy of God. But what we don't calculate normally is the distance between the willingness and the doing. And the many factors in between that kill the ability to do from the ability to win. I hope I said that sentence right. So, to will is present with me. Romans 7. But to do, I find not the strength. Now, the question that believers don't ask is how come I am willing, I'm never able to do. What is in between willingness and doing that always finds a way to kill what I'm willing to do? And the simplest answer there is unbelief. Now, that's why the Bible says, wherefore, beside this, giving all diligence, ah, sorry, eh, Philippians 2.12, as you have obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear. So the problem is that we have fear for the things that are earthly. We don't have fear for the things that are divine. Look at this. When it comes to the things that are earthly, if Satan says to you, what if you fail? The problem is that there are not too many believers who are strong enough to say, what if I succeed? There are not too many believers who are willing to say, I know the God who stirred up this willingness in me. Oh, let me explain something. I was speaking to Pastor Edosa today, Pastor Ampi, and I said something. I think I even alluded to it in the prosperity conference. But listen to this. All of the miracles of Jesus, all of the miracles of multiplication that Jesus did happened on the go. Master, they are hungry. He takes five loaves of bread, lifts them up, gives thanks, bring it down, and he still five loaves of bread. As of me. Then he gives it to you and he says, distribute it among this multitude. It takes a track record of who he is for you not to throw it on the ground and walk away. Leave it there. And no even breaks it. I got Kempia's heart. <laughs> Sir, you broke my sweet bone in no break. The first natural reaction, if you wait upon your senses, and all of his multiplications happen like that, lifted it, gave thanks, brought it down, it was still the way he lifted it. If you consider it humanly, the miracle has failed already. Then he says, you will take shade. So if they, they did not dare to begin to share it, why will you give me, how many sweets are in this bowl? Why will you tell me to share it in the old church? Will I use my mouth to, uh, to break the sweet inside the leather so that everybody can get a piece? Sir, he didn't pray for water inside the jar. He told them, fill the jar with water. They finished filling it. He didn't even do one. As they were filling the last jar, then he told them, fetch the water. Then he didn't say, test it. He said, take it set to the governor of the feast. He said to Peter, borrow me your boat. I'm showing you the miracles so that you know that it's consistent. That means that the only, if it's God you want to work with you, the only way is that if he says go, what you have will not multiply. You must start going. The multiplication happens in your obedience. Uh -huh. 
much more as you have obeyed. Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. That's why I told you on Sunday, you limited, oh, it was on Friday. You limited the assignment because you were checking what was in the rubber. What you wanted you to do is turn it. Then you realize that at turning it, nothing ever stopped flowing. It just kept flowing. It was not increasing in the rubber, but it is flowing. That's how you multiply. These guys have toiled all night. He came, borrowed. Yeah. Then he said, okay, you guys, go down small now. Let's catch fish. Then they were first looking at him like, are you all right? No, let's use Luke 5. Luke 5 is even sweeter. He just said, Good, guys, do you have fish? He said, Kai, Master, today is a very bad deal. Then he said, cast your net to the right side. Now, let me ask you. You let me ask you, do you now think that they did not cast their net before to the right side? You think it was the first time they were casting their net to the right side? There were only two states of hearts, and I can tell you. It's either they say, eh, well, let's cast it so that we can show you that you're a fool. It, yes. Or else. They will have been saying, well, it's not like we have not tried it, but because you have spoken. So when they say, but at thy word, it, was, it couldn't have been disdain. If it was disdain, if they cast their net, they will catch nothing. That means multiplication belongs to those who are able to foolishly obey and start to do the things that he asked you to do. Are you following? What question are we answering? How do we activate the power? Now, I said to you, between willing and doing, everything in between is unbelief. It's either you fear men, you fear outcomes, you fear failure. Everything in between is unbelief. In fact, sometimes you don't fear men, you don't fear outcome, you don't fear failure. You just fear losing the life that you are going to have to live to try this life. And so you find out that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Many times because people have not had one encounter of God that shows them the goodness of God. It becomes increasingly difficult for them to take the step into the next encounter of God. Shared certain testimonies with my daughter, Pastor Edusa, this evening. And when, when I shared it, I was showing her how that all it took is to say to God, This is, ah, God says, Okay, this is what you have to do next. Yeah, this is it. You step in there and find out that people were waiting. There were people who were waiting, but they didn't know they were waiting. It's like the widow that was commanded that didn't receive any command. Because when you met the widow, she didn't look commanded. You, you see, see the same thing we are talking about personally. If the woman was not foolish, she said, it's only the last one that she may know. Then cook for me and my son. Then we will just eat it and die. Then the foolish prophet now said to her, cook for me first. No, no, that means your own eating has now been suspended. Just get ready to die. That's what her normal senses should have been saying to her. What did she hear in the voice of Elijah that made that she could go and obey? So sometimes when God wants to be merciful to you, then he causes prophets to pass by. Then instructions are given. You know why I, I said when God wants to be merciful to you? Because many times if he gave you that instruction in the secret, you will think it is me that is thinking. Then what you were thinking, you now came to the public. Then we converted it to an instruction. So that by two immutable things.
listen, I have enjoyed the goodness of God. And I'm not, I'm not claiming a stature in faith. I've enjoyed the goodness of God to at least a degree that I can recommend it. There is nothing we have done. Nothing we have done. Nothing we have done that we set out with enough resource to finish. But there's nothing we started that God did not send resources to meet us. Except it's not about obedience. Are you following me? Thank you, media. I've seen the question. There's a question online. The question is that, is the concept of saving and investing relevant in the context of kingdom prosperity? If it comes by obedience, not covetousness. Simple answer. I'm not out of here. Listen. What Jonah discovered in the belly of the fish in Jonah chapter 3 is that everyone who observes lying vanities will forsake their mercy. Now, let's use, I'm sure somebody in their mind is saying, Pastor, what is Jonah? What has Jonah got to do with investment? People, you don't get tired of me sometimes. You should, sir, please, where is Jonah in this concept? Look at this. Saving and investment is part of the bread system. All right? So let me, let me ease in the answer. Let me do like we're in a seminar. Because when I, if I do Jonah now, it will look like it's deeply spiritual. Saving and investment is in the bread system. And so when scripture said man shall not live by bread alone, it didn't say man shall not live by bread. In fact, scripture told them man shall not live by bread alone because God was about to release them back into the bread system. Because the concept of bread in Deuteronomy chapter, is that three or six? Where Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone. Eight, Deuteronomy eight. It's not, ha. Ah, the concept of bread is your agricultural concept of sowing and reaping and living according to what you sowed and rep, reaped. Reaped. Too much English is bad, I'm telling you. All right? Are you following me? So, when the Bible says he... he thank you. Go back, verse 2. Look at this, because you need to see it. And as I remember, all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, Reverend Tendi read this, right? What, why did he lead you through that 40 years? To humble you, uh -huh, to prove you, uh -huh, to know what is in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or no. Now, look at this. The essence of the wilderness is humble you, prove you, see what's in your heart, know whether you keep his commandments or no. That means... I like the way Reverend Tende said it. They came out with silver and gold, but he did not lead them to shop right. Baba has said it for many years. There was no place where they could spend the silver and gold. So the silver and gold became weight. Notice that it was that silver and gold that they used to carve the calf. And it was that same silver and gold that they ended up using to build the temple. That means that silver and gold was always designated for worship. Mm. Always. If you don't use it to serve God, you will use it to serve Satan. It's, it's normal. It's just normal. But look at this. What God had just done was that he has plucked them out of a bread system. Alright? Next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Look at this. And... He humbled thee. He actually suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with what? The, what words there is which thou knowest not? 
Aye. That means you are used to a system where you know my job pays me 90K as salary. My job pays me 200K as salary. So I will cut my cuts according to my salary. I eat how much I earn. It's a cost. It's not today now. Uh, we proved it through the weekend. It's a curse. You can't eat your salary. You, you cannot. You cannot. Your life must be bigger than what you earn. And I'm not teaching you being wasteful. I'm teaching you living by faith. And if your life must be bigger than what you earn, and you are not going to be wasteful, it means you are going to be obedient. No, I wish you understand what I just said. That means what we say you must live bigger than what you earn. Go on. You can't wake up and say, Kempia, so you see what pastor has been teaching. So today like this, as we are collecting salary, we'll finish it. So that we can prove that God, eh, eh. you don't help, you don't, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's exactly what you just did. You are tempting God. That becomes necessary when the Lord says to you, ah, can I have a, come on, you can't be eating like that now without meat. Jacob, you Say, Lord, I'll be eating. this is third of the month. Listen, let me tell you some of the earliest signs you will find. Many times when you step out to buy meat, you will now find somebody buying meat there. Who you know? Ah, yeah, I don't care what you say now. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, cut me one kilo out. Say, cut me half kilo out. Say, Kai, I'm going to say, one kilo. That's going to be a half man. Then say, wow. Ah, to not go there. Then when it was time to pay, then he pays for the two kilos. Now, let me tell you, let me ask you, Goma. You will have sat at home. Eat the food that your salary deserves. Do you understand it? What you did not know was that God did not even need the contribution of your salary to dash you meat. He just needed your faith moving in the direction of the market by the prompting that is in your heart. The problem is you are too afraid of scarcity to obey. So the only way to not be reckless is to be obedient. Now follow me. It's something I'm trying to show you. That the bread system was not... Ah, man shall not live by bread alone. was not talking about food. Because they live by food now. The manna was bread. Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 6... Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they perished. I am that bread that comes from heaven that a man will eat and live forever. So manna was bread. So how can he feed them with manna to prove to them that man shall not live by bread alone? To prove to them that man shall not live by bread alone, he should not have fed them. That's what says. Ha! Ah. Is your sense coming alive now? If I want to prove to you that man shall not live by bread alone, what should I do? Not give you bread. And then prove to you that you cannot die because you did not eat. But he gave them manna so that he can prove to them that man shall not live by bread alone. It means that bread here is not food. Bread is the system where you know where your food is coming from. You calculate how to regulate it and then that's bread. Uh-huh. Now, hear this. Which was we are going to? Because the person asked an investment question. Hear this. When God was done proving them in the wilderness, they had money, they didn't have what to buy with it. God had to send them bread from heaven. They ate and all of that. God was about to now send them back to a bread system. Verse 16. Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8, 16. No, go back. Two verses, 14. Go back two verses. Go 
Deuteronomy 8, 14. Okay. Then thine heart be lifted up. Hey. Kai, 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 kai. No, go to 10. We shall just marry the whole thing. 10, 10, 10. 9, go. 9, go. Give us 9. Pastor Nismo says it's 9. I believe him. He's a man of God. Aha. God was describing the land that he was bringing them into. He said, a land where you will eat. Uh -uh. That means I'm sending you back to the place where they eat bread. Oh. And you shall not lack a land whose stones are and out of whose hills thou mayest dig. That's just. Hallelujah. But then, what did he say? When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt what? Do you remember what I said about Thanksgiving earlier? That whatever seems to be coming to you consistently, if you don't learn to put the all God around it, you commonize it. So what Thanksgiving does is that it puts back all to what you are collecting consistently. When thou hast eaten and thou art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land. It is there for the food. That means you are now back to sowing and reaping from the land. That means manna was not designed to be a system that will last forever. So God started the story from manna to say, I plucked you out of bread, brought you into manna, and sent you back into bread, not because bread is your source. So God breaks the stuff of bread when bread becomes source. So you find out that Ruth was born out of the fact that there was a famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. There was a famine in Bethlehem. So God comes to the house of bread and breaks the staff of bread because his children will no longer look up to him. Are you following me? One of the reasons for the captivity to Babylon, I told you, was that Israel had lived for two, 210 years without observing the Sabbath year. They were observing the Sabbath days, but they were not observing the Sabbath year. And in the Sabbath year, the land was designed to rest. Now, why were they not observing the Sabbath year? Let me ask you. Somebody say bread. Why? Because it doesn't make sense for the land to, find, to lie fallow. Well, we can have more food. So God realized that Israel had returned their mind back to the land as their source. Follow, follow. Okay. When thou hast eaten and art full, thou shalt bless the Lord for the good land which he has given you. Next verse, next verse, next verse. Quickly, 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 quickly. 11. Beware the warning starts that in not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command thee this day. God was dropped. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and have built what? Goodly houses and you have dwelt therein. Next verse 13. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, 14, then why will your heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which are a hair from the house of bondage. Next verse. I hope you are reading it. Verse 15. Who led you through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water? Who brought thee forth water out of the work of lint? Next verse. Verse 16. Who fed thee with which thy fathers you see it has come out again. Ba? That he might and he might 
to do the good and die. Now you see that latter end is when he restores them back to the bread system. Next verse. Verse 17, you see something? 17. And thou shalt say what? Oh, the problem is that you're, you left where this story started very early. It's verse 14 that connects to verse 17. So verse 15 and 16 makes you forget what was said in verse 14. Take us back to verse 14. 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. Aye, na pentium too. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee. Aha. Uh -huh. What's it? Oh, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, don't go to 18. 17. 17. Out of the house of bondage. Next verse. Verse 17, 17, 17, 17. Says, what computer is this? And thou shalt say, Oh, no, 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 no. That means, because you can calculate the bread system, the tendency is to attribute your outcomes to your strength or skill. That's what makes your heart proud. Listen to this. So I will answer the question again with the first statement and I hope it makes sense. What place has investments and what, flash the question, and savings in this prosperity matter? Instruction. You must bind all your savings and all your investments to the places where God instructed you to start saving and to start investing. Because if it does not happen like that, Deuteronomy chapter 8 will catch up with you. When your investments multiply, you'll be thinking, man, we are smart. Even if you are saying, wow, God helped us. You are actually saying with your mouth what your heart does not believe. So you start to find out that if your investments worked out, your heart will be lifted up in pride because you will begin to believe that people are poor because they are not smart. Do you understand it? So you'll be looking at your brethren like, ah, Pastor Aide, you are still in this level. The reason why you are there is because you are not smart. When you see people who think like that, what actually happened to them is that the instructions, sorry, the investments that lifted them did not come by instruction. If it came by instruction, you will need to remember the Lord your God. Then you will be thankful that the Lord led you where he led you. Led you to invest what you invested and blessed that investment. You must even mark the days where that investment should have sunk, but the Lord saved it because his commandment was upon it. So listen, I took the, that long route to say to you, God can send you back to the systems of men to prosper you. He can prosper the work of your hands. I mean, he can prosper... Especially one of the things I, I thought I was going to speak about in prosperity conference is to say to every believer, except if you feel restrained, I remembered here what Reverend Kure, what Apostle Kure said to us, that it should have been normal for you at 30 years old to have your house. He said he thought it for many years and he has raised people who live. When he said it, I thought around and I said to myself, wow, that's significantly true. Most of Apostle Kure's people that I know are living in their own houses. Now, you know the curse in the middle bed. We think of building our house when we retire at 65. When our gratuity and pension. But in God's order of prosperity, you should prosper in order to build goodly houses. Houses. Plural. Just KV8. Now, let me say this. This is what, ah, thank you, Lord Jesus. He just reminded me. That's what I was, that took me to that apostle saying. Listen to this. 
except otherwise instructed by God. I believe that, listen, you cannot prosper to the degree that God wants you to prosper. No, cannot is too absolute. You, you are not likely to prosper to the degree to which God wants you to prosper under another man's system. Are you following? I have to make exceptions out of it. Because, listen to this. If you stay under another man's system, and I'm speaking to those of you who work secularly, in the priesthood it operates a bit differently. But if you stay under another man's system, let it be that the assignment you have there is clear. That what you are doing there is not, you didn't go there to prosper. You went there to fulfill an assignment. And it was God who planted you there. That assignment is very likely going to open doors of favor for you that are far beyond what the man is willing to give you. Listen. The best Joseph could have been in the house of Potiphar is chief servant. He requires to be in his own house or work for a bigger boss. Oh, I wish you heard it. So, because he was tagged a servant, God had to lift him out of the custody of Potiphar, albeit within controversial circumstances. God lifted him out of that system with the intent to set him under a bigger boss or set him over a bigger boss. Because one of the things you will end up finding out was that if you read Genesis carefully, Pharaoh did not regulate what Joseph earned. So Joseph could negotiate for a part of Egypt and was given to him. Because at that point, Pharaoh was more afraid to lose Joseph than he was trying to control him. Oh, the wisdom that is flying in this atmosphere is not small. There's a spirit of wisdom and revelation operational here now. Do you understand? So, except otherwise instructed by God already, the average believer, if you pick up a job to do, keep your heart alive for the instructions God will give you to establish systems that when God blesses, no man can limit. I wish you heard me. Like I said, I'm not talking to the priestly right now. I'm talking to those of you who are called to the kingly. In the priestly, it operates a bit differently. But hear this and understand it very well. Listen, if you work, if you do civil service work, let me say the way it will annoy you. Start to sell kunu. Because if the Lord wants to bless you, he's not likely going to promote you in civil service. He's likely going to cause them to be looking for that kunu in England. The reason is because whatever blessing you find within the context of civil service, your immediate supervisor. You understand it? It's like our lecturers in view who will use us to write their thesis. Then they will go and do paper presentation in America. Do you understand? On top of your shoulder, you did the whole work. He left a doctor, he came back an associate prof. What they don't know is that it's you that was supposed to be associate prof. But everyone is looking at you as a master student. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you find out that many times systems limit the process of the prosperity of the righteous because many times the righteous does not have the dogged faith that makes that they can step out on their own and establish systems and trust God to breathe on it. Listen to this. And that step out has to be done by instruction. Do you understand me? Now the problem is that too many times when God instructed, we were too afraid. We run such fearful systems. Now that's the reason why your father said to you, don't think of marriage until you get a government job. You see when they say that government job, what they are telling is, 
job security. So we're not teaching our children from early to take risks. My daughter came to me a few days ago. I said, Daddy, I want a loan. How much? She said, 20K. I said, for what? She said, she wants to start selling bow and perfumes. I did like I did not hear. I walked away. I told her mother, I will give her the money. Because she has to learn now to walk around and say, buy my perfume. Buy my perfume. Then when she returns, she can lift up her extra 2K profit and say, Father, thank you. And I've wondered, I've given her when she's going to return my money. Uh, she's in church now. She's there now, I told her. She's going to return my money. What lies it? I've not known. Eh? Come on, some loan. 15K. Are you following me? Because please hear me, and especially those of us who are parents. Let's teach our children the ability to take risks. Let them start small as teenagers. Then when they break their teenage, tell them, no, no, they are too big for this thing. Because when you even dare to step out of organized systems and start things small. The next thing is that Satan will confront you with a smallness mindset. So that the best you can do is keep that thing small. And he does exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think, but only according to the power that is at work in you. So if you started by selling perfumes for people to spray and bow for people to hold their head, I don't expect that three years later, we will still be selling perfume and bow. We will have created a bow company or a perfume company. And I'm her father. I have the money. I have the faith. We will do it. Do you understand it? Because all of the glory of the rise of the house of Potiphar went to Potiphar. But all the work was done by Joseph. So the highest Joseph knew was the favor of Potiphar. One of my friends said it's the way he blessed me. He said, God lifted and blessed the house of Potiphar because he was targeting to touch Joseph. Oh, I wish you heard me. So Potiphar became a big man. But what God was looking for is Joseph needs to live better. So imagine if Joseph had his own system. Anybody get him blessed? So understand it. Please, in the midst of this, don't let any of the things we have said today put you under pressure to do things that God didn't say to you. But if there's anything what we are saying should do to you, it's as you open your heart to a vast possibility. Tell yourself, God has no limitation to instruct me. Not by any means. Even my resources will not limit him as to how much he wants to instruct me. If you like, you tell me that you go and own the abattoir. If my present money will buy only two goats, I'll buy two goats and tie them. But every time I look at the abattoir, I'll tell the abattoir, you are mine. I'm coming for you. I came with two goats and the blessing of the Lord. Is anybody hearing me? It is normal for a believer to expect what he does to grow. It is the culture of the blessing of the Lord. And the distance of the blessing of the Lord is until all the families of the earth are blessed by him. That means if one man has the kind of faith of Abraham, he can start a product that will enter every house on earth. The products are many now. There's already too many products that are in every house of the earth. People who supply internet connectivity to you. Which house are they not in? If people without God can touch every family on the earth, why will you start a product and only be trusting God for your street?
Listen, the dominion mentality does not even permit a believer to think like that. We carry ourselves with such contentment and such humility, but contentment and humility don't touch our vision. What I mean is that my vision is not content, it is not humble. Do you understand this? Your vision is not supposed to be humble. Your vision is not supposed to be content. You are supposed to be content. You are supposed to be humble. But your vision is permitted to run wild. And every time you think about how far your vision should go, attach it to the blessing of the Lord. Don't attach it to your sense. Don't attach it to your skill. Don't even attach it to how good the product is. The hand of the Lord is upon me. What I start is ordained to touch the ends of the earth. That's how I believe what it. I told my wife when I was 19 that I will preach a message and six billion people on earth will stop to listen. I still believe it. Amen. That time there was no internet. So I wasn't talking internet followership. I told, I said 19, I was 19 when I said to my heart that I'm convinced by the hand of God that I will speak a message. I didn't say nine, six billion Christians. They are not up to 6 billion Christians on earth. That means that I am too convinced that the wisdom that will proceed from it will compel every man to stop. Pastor, what if it doesn't come to pass in your lifetime? At least I've enjoyed the joy of my wild imagination. Because when I finish imagining it, I get up, charged in the spirit. My calabria is what is. If that's all I gain, I lost nothing. I figured out that the least right you have is the right to dream. I was, I was joking with them Benin last year. My friends thought, uh, covered. I said to them, the rice you cannot eat physically. At least eat it in your dream. Do you get it? If you pastor four people now and you believe you are called to the nations, when you sleep in the night, pastor the nations. The problem is that Satan has constrained our thinking to such a small space because he has defined us to ourselves as grasshoppers. So every time we get up to take a move, it's all right that you started small, but every thought you attached to it was also small. So Satan found a way to trap you. If God even showed you an opportunity, you thought this opportunity is too big. So you look at a proposal and you believe that to put this together, you have to have like a 10 million naira facility. All facilities that I have now are like just like 200k. Oh boy, let's trust God for the future. Did you go to God and he told you to trust him for the future? You don't know that there are some people that 10 million is nothing to. And that if you walked up to them with that dream and said, this is where this thing is going to. But this is what I need. You have the 10 million I need. I have the vision. Bring it. When the profit comes, I'll give you 40%. And people will be willing to part with money in multiple millions to service the vision. Except that too many believers don't even have the courage to believe God enough for God to say, see the person you should go and talk to concerning that vision. So too many beautiful dreams dying with believers in their graves. Why? Because I told you, the gap between willing and doing, everything in between is either faith or unbelief. If what you willed, you ever did, in between it is faith. If what you willed, you never did, in between it is unbelief. you follow him. Let's pray in the spirit for a moment. We have a question to take, but let's pray in the spirit for a moment. Ask for the spirit of faith. Ask for courage. I told you a million and one times, the gift of faith is a gift that God has given to me freely. 
So pray in the spirit like believers would and activate that gift of faith. Because many times when God wants to multiply you, he sends you back to the bread system. He sends you back to work, sends you back to investment, sends you back to savings. But he has to command how that season runs in your life. Say to God, Lord, grant me courage to step into the waters. You called me out upon the water. A great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mist, in ocean steep. My faith will stand. Play it again. You call me out upon the waters. The great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mist, in ocean sea. My faith will stand. Play one more time. Come on, pray in the spirit. You call me out upon the the great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mist in ocean steep my faith will stand I will call upon your name I keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Oh I will call I will call upon your name. I keep my eyes above the way. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours. And you
of the spirit of faith we release upon your sons and your daughters the ability to dream the ability to activate the power that is already at work within us since the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us he that raised Christ from the dead by the same spirit quickens our mortal bodies Lord, let even our bodies that carry this assignment be quickened for it by the power that is at work within us. Lord, grant us faith and courage for the days that are ahead. That by obedience, O oh God, we will move from the power to will into the power to do. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We receive it now. In Jesus name and everyone shout say amen. amen. Come on celebrate the Lord and take your seats. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Please flash that next question. Let me answer. I, I hope you don't have more than one question left. Amen. Media, are you flashing that question in the spirit? All right. My question is about the curse of Adam and how it relates to Christ and our salvation. What about the curse on the woman? Whoa. Well, Reverend Tindy began to speak about it. You'll find out that if you run through the curse or... You know I've told you too many times, I don't call that the curse. It's actually the consequence. But if you run through the things that were pronounced as the consequence... There are literal things that Jesus went through in, on his way to the cross that shows you that Christ has actually redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Um, go there. Go there. Let me show you. Mm. Mm. Okay, 17, 317. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. All right? Genesis 317. 317. Sweet Holy Spirit, help me now. 317. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, what he gave in redemption is the voice of the shepherd. And as eating of the tree, as I, that I commanded you not know, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake right and in sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of your life next verse verse 18 look at this thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field that was actually speaking about medicine next verse not food next verse in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return 20 and adam called his wife's name eve because she was the mother of all living so go back to verse 19 you'll find out that tons and thistles were actually the things that was we used to wave his crown and the sweat of the brow was actually what was replaced with the dripping of the blood that came from his brow. That's actually the reason why the crown of thorns were put upon his head. Um, the cost on the ground, the cost on the ground, the cost on the ground. Um, Gethsemane, okay, the sorrow from which he was supposed to eat was what Jesus bore in the pain that he bore in his heart in Gethsemane. Are you following me? The cross on the ground, I did a study on it. I will I'll come back to you on it. I, I just decided to take that out to show you that in what Christ paid for was the direct linkage to the curse that was waiting upon man. All right? Um, now, what about the woman? Um, what was the curse that was upon the woman? Um, your desire shall be towards your man, and he shall rule over you, and in great sorrow shall... Good, thank you. And unto the woman, he said, I greatly multiply thy so sorrow... And thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, what you find in Galatians chapter 3, is that Galatians 3 or Galatians chapter 4? Paul said there's no male or female. What you will find there is that Christ did not only redeem us from the curse that was upon the man, he also redeemed the woman from the curse that was upon her. All right? I will have to, I'm answering this hesitantly and in a hurry because I'm considering our time. There's one other subject that's in my heart to touch tonight. But listen, many times I've referred to some Timothy chapter 3 where Paul said to Timothy, and she shall be delivered through childbearing if they continue in faith and all of that. Now, you find out that Christ couldn't have redeemed the man from the curse and not redeem the woman from the curse. In fact, if you understand the workings of the curse, if you are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll find out that the workings of the curse causes that every curse that is upon the man is also upon the woman. Uh, the only difference is that the curse that was upon the woman is not upon the man. So the curse pronounced on the man was actually a mutual curse. 
The curse pronounced on the woman was an independent curse. You didn't get it. Do you now think that the ground is not cursed for the woman's sake? She go and till it and see whether it will open because she's a woman. She also requires the sweat of her brow. Uh -huh. And Paul explained it later in 2 Timothy and he told you that it wasn't the man who first sinned. It was the man who, first, who was deceived and then sinned. And because the woman, um, he had said there that the woman was taken off the man, the man was not taken off the woman. That means the woman is, the, is a partaker of the man, the man is not a partaker of the woman. Do you understand? Does it make sense? Now, but when Christ came to redeem, he did not redeem the man. He redeemed mankind. So man and woman are redeemed. Are you following me? The only other thing I can say on that, listen to this, very simple, is that just like we arrive at by faith, being delivered from the curse that is upon all of man, which is what we share mutually, right? The same kind of faith that is required for us to come out of there, you will have to exercise on the other things that does not affect us. Do you get it? So, a woman can still sustain pain in childbearing, not because Christ has not paid. Do you understand it? But because faith. Now, when we say faith, you must understand that even for those of us who are male men, all right? Let me help you understand it. Because redemption is being, is unfolding. At the ultimate unfolding of redemption, we will stop dying, all of us. So as surely as we are still dying, redemption is still unfolding. We are still in the journey of faith to appropriate all that redemption has purchased. If you got it, let me hear an amen. Now, so you understand that the same faith that is taking us to that place where we are going to undo death is the same faith you need to exercise to stop the things that Christ has. And of course, it is also obvious that it can be paid for and you still live and languish under the yoke of. Are you following me? So both man and woman, woman have been redeemed. Amen? Come on, I said amen. Why well, you, the time has finished. I got it. Okay, blessed be God. Is there any other question there? Media, is there any other question there? Hmm? Okay, it's obvious that the questions are finished, right? Okay, so let me touch the subject I tried to touch on Sunday to see the degree to which you understand it. Can we touch it? Can we touch it? Revelation chapter 5. Forgive me, I'm just setting my watch so that I can use it. Revelation chapter 5. You remember that in Revelation chapter 5, I'm going to do this in 10 minutes by the grace of the Almighty God. It's doable. Amen? You understand the first part of the story. No one was found worthy. Then the elder said, Weep not, John, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, uh, all right? Then you will notice that there were three songs. It's the three songs I want to take note of. Verse 8. First song, when you are taking the book, the four beasts and the twenty and four elders. Right? And the twenty and four elders, part of the things I didn't get to say to you before is that you will find out that the first song was the song of the redeemed and it was the beasts and the elders that sang it. All right? Because the elders are actually a heavenly representation of the two covenants that God had on the earth, established on two twelves. Right? The first covenant was the covenant of God with Abraham, established upon the strength of the twelve tribes of Israel. Are we together? I say, are we together? All right? The second covenant was the covenant that came by Jesus or the New Testament covenant that was established on the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So if you see the description of everything in heaven, every 12 was represented by apostles and Israel. So the two covenants that God honors on the earth are the covenant that he has with the Jews, 
and the covenant that he has with the Gentiles. And even Paul told you that he has made out of twine one new man. So you understand that God honors those two covenants. So the 20 and 4 elders who sing, sit before the throne, especially extracting from this song, please don't take that scripture away from the board. The stars are not helping us. Thank you. Especially from this song that is about to be sung in verse 9 seems to imply that whatever sings this song is singing on behalf of the earth. Verse 9, look at this very carefully. I'm doing this because I know that many of you left this place on Sunday a bit of shaking, alright? Uh, and I don't want to, verse 9, verse 9, verse 9. Having hearts a vast full, which is the prayer of the saints, verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. I've seen it. I'm, they don't come kill him. Please let's find out what's happening there. Responding like a pentium one. And they sung a new song. All right? First song. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood uh -huh, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it. They are still in verse 9. I've finished verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests and what? And we shall reign on the earth. Now, that song, at the close of it, tells you this is the song of the redeemed. Or it gives you the purpose of salvation. And the purpose of salvation is that the redeemed will reign on the earth. But what my emphasis was, was the category of people that sang it. It was those who were around the throne. Now, the next song was sung by everything in heaven. So you see that the song went from like this to like this to like that. In the inner carcass, the discussion is that this thing that you have done will cause us to reign on earth. Are you following me? What's the next song? Say it with a loud voice by 12. Okay, sorry, verse 11. So that we can describe the next. So the first song was the song of the throne. And I beheld and I heard the voice of what? It started with angels. And angels are not around the throne. They are heavenly beings. The, the constituents of the throne is the four living creatures and the 24 elders. So throne matters is living creatures and elders. Heaven matters, angels have entered. In fact, you will find out that there were more angels in verse 11, than they were elders and beasts. I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was what? Couldn't have been the beasts. How many were the beasts? Four living creatures. How many were the elders? Let's see the amount of people that were singing here. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That means this was majorly a song of the angels. But you will find out that if the angels sang, the elders sang, and the beast sang. So the song has swollen from the throne to all of heaven. Now what does all of heaven say? Worthy is the lamb that was slain to collect. That means this thing that he has done makes him deserving of power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor, and glory, and blessings. That means, let's borrow from the song of the throne. For us to reign on the earth, what we bought must have made us worthy of uh -huh. wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. 
Then, of course, the Bible says, to him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. That means heaven considers them worthy of ruling. Next song. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven, uh huh, uh huh, and such are, and all that are in, heard I saying, what? Blessing, uh huh, and, and be unto him that sits on the throne, and. Now, the problem is that the moment we brought in earth, and the things we need the earth, the worship reduced from seven elements to four. And the four elements were consciously within the seven. Right? That means we either study the four that they sang, or we study the three that they left out, and find out why they left out three. All right? And what we have chosen to do, or what we chose to do on Sunday, was to check the three that they left out and ask why did they leave this out all right and what are the three they left out wisdom which is a strength right psalm 110 the bible says the lord said unto my lord sit at my right hand wait when was that when he came back with his blood so after this song let us suppose because this is the song of the redeemed this is this vision was the vision because when john was speaking about it they were still asking who is worthy so it's either heaven was acting a drama or this was the moment when he was coming in yeah, yeah, yeah. now are you following me which one do you think okay i thought you think that they used to act drama from time to time to remember when he came back so God took John to the moment Jesus was coming in. It was almost like a coronation or reception ceremony. So that when they cried, who is worthy? While John was weeping because of its effect on the earth, listen to this, the elders already knew that he has already finished prevailing. Then they saw the lamb. Now look at this. So when the lamb finished that ceremony, the father said to him, Look at this, look at this. Sit thou at my right hand until I make all thine enemies thy footstool. Now, if it takes those seven, seven elements, just believe with me, okay? Because without time. If it takes those seven elements to rule the earth, and that's true till today. If it takes those seven elements to rule the earth, if we have not attributed three to him, it then means that we cannot surrender as it were completely. Mm -hmm. So you travel to Revelation chapter 11 and you find that there was now a singing in heaven that declared that the kingdoms of this world are become. That means something happens somewhere in between that compels that what was not given to him by the earth has now been deliberately handed over. Listen to this. So Psalm 110 verse 1 The Lord said to my Lord and Peter helped to explain that that David couldn't have been he must have been speaking about the Christ but the Lord said to Jesus sit thou at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. That means after you have won this victory, there are still enemies that are in contention of this victory, but I want to show you how I'm going to defeat them. Alright? Verse 2, look at it carefully. Oh, oh no, no, no. You didn't hear it. You didn't see it. Eh? Sir, did you see it? The Lord shall send the rod of what? Stop! What was the other thing they didn't call? Good. Where is he coming out from? Okay. Aha. That means it will take those who arrive at Zion's assembly 
to become the extension of your strength. That means that the release of your strength came after you have been coronated in heaven. Do you understand it? That means his strength had not yet been revealed on the earth. And God told him that I will release the rod of your strength from out of Zion. And it will have the command that will cause everyone who bears the rod of that strength to rule in the midst. Sit here until I make your, your, how will I do it? I will release the rod of your strength to go forth from Zion so that it compels your enemies to come under your feet. Now that tells you that strength was something Christ did not display. He left it for us to display. Are you following? So the working of his strength, like I said, was not necessarily, was not necessary. You remember I told you that, no, let's not, let's do riches last. Because we just came out of a prosperity convention. So let's do wisdom, right? Thank God it is him that gives you power to get wealth. And I went, Tendi told us that the power is what? Wisdom. wisdom. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 6, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Albeit not, uh, sorry, not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of the princes of this world, which come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God. Ah, okay, that let me open it. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, let me show you where my problem started from. Which God ordained that means in God's ordination it was kept like that before the world. And when it is revealed, it will bring us to our glory. Please follow. He said in the next verse, which none of the princes of this world knew. Ah. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That means if the, if the princes of this world saw this wisdom, the Prince of glory they crucified, they will have worshipped. How do we know that that's what said? Because verse 9 said, but as it is written, I had not seen. Sorry. Ah. But as it is written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared that means you can substitute the wisdom of God for the words the things which God had prepared for them that love him but God has revealed them unto us verse 10 by his spirit for the spirit searches all things even what the deep things of God for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man except the spirit of God. Excuse me, saints. What is, what is things of God here? The wisdom of God. Next verse. Now, we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is with one intent only, so that we might know. So wait, 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 wait. So it seems like there's something that binds wisdom to a manifestation of glory that will compel the princes of this world to bow at our feet. Okay, so that you are not too confused. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's start from verse 8. Media, I'm going to need you to cooperate with me on this one. Thank you. Oh my God. Look at this. Unto me 
who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the hidden riches of Christ. Next verse. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery. We speak the wisdom of God in what? Which was can you see the words repeating themselves? Which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus. Verse 10. This is the intention of God that now wait, 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 wait. unto who in might be known the manifold that means the princes of this world were designed not to see the wisdom of God except through the church. So when it was in display in Christ, it was hidden. But when it will be in our own display, it will become manifest to the manifold, to the principalities and powers. That then means that, ah, it is then clear that strength is left for the church. Wisdom is also left for the church to display. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Do you understand it a little clearer now? Yes, sir. On Sunday I was looking at your eyes. I knew you didn't get it. I was looking at your eyes. I knew, where you? Where you? These people are lost. But I had to preach and get out of the way. Because I needed our guests to speak. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Okay, go back. Because let's, let's contextualize it. 8.6. In so much as desire tells us that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you this same grace also. And if you follow very closely, you find the word grace in all of them. All right? Next verse. Verse 8. I don't want to keep us too late. Let's go. Verse 8, 8, 8, 8. I speak not... Okay, sorry. Was that verse 6 I read last? Give me verse 7. Seven. Therefore, as you are bound in how many things? In everything. What are the everythings? Faith, utterance, knowledge, and in all. And in your love to us, see that you are bound in this grace also. Which grace is that? I speak not by commandment but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. That means, ultimately, this grace is tied to the sincerity of your love. Let me tell you what it means. It means that there's no way, because, hey, Philippians after 2 will have done this work, but let's leave it tonight. There is no way the love of Christ will abound inside of you. Do you remember James saying, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, that means that if faith ever provoked love inside of you, your righteousness becomes frustrated if you are not able to execute this grace. Does it make sense? I took the time to explain that one. That one, you looked like you understood it. So, say yes now so that I can know it. All right? So, the release of this grace, as it were, gives expression to your righteousness. It's called the fruit of your righteousness. So, it's like your righteousness gets space to breathe. When you are bound in this grace. Because it means that everything you see, you can execute. And when we say everything you see, we are not saying everything your flesh desires. Every good work you see, you can execute. You see it, you do it. You see it, you do it. So he said, I speak not by commandment. He said, but by occasion of fullness of others, to prove the sincerity of your love. Then he said, for you know the manifestation of this grace in the Lord Jesus. Look at this. Please permit my paraphrase. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, listen, listen, what was he asking you to do? He was asking you to give. Share. 
He was asking you to find expression, give to others. Now, he didn't say, though Jesus was rich in glory, he fetched his riches and gave us. That's not the grace of Jesus. The grace that was given to Jesus is for our sakes. He needs to become poor. You will get it. A few people got it. The grace is inviting you to is abound so you can distribute. But then he said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, sir. Let's do it. I think they will, they will, they will get it now. Look at this. Paul was saying, abound. Have so much so that you can distribute. Then he said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if he was making Jesus the example, he would have shown you how Jesus had so much and he distributed. But you remember that I told you at the beginning of that conference that provision is not prosperity. And what Jesus lived in was provision. Hey. So there was nothing Jesus needed that he lacked. Hear me? There was nothing Jesus needed that he lacked. So you could not look at Jesus and say he was rich. Because he made his bed with the rich in his death. That's what the prophet prophesied. That means when he was walking the earth, you could not look at him and say, this guy is rich. For instance, Pastor Kephas, people tell you that if you check the clothes that he wore, all of that, soldiers were fighting over it, you don't know when they dash in the clothes. Maybe it was two days before, two weeks before. Maybe it was that day of triumphant entry. Don't, don't get it wrong. He couldn't have worn the same clothes for three and a half years. He was not in the wilderness. Uh, I'll tell you a few other things. In his day, royalty rode on horses. He walked on foot. You can't take it away. So that even the day he needed to display royalty, he didn't climb horse. He climbed Jackie because it's Jackie that was the prophecy. <laughs> Not because it was Jackie that was royalty. So Israel was left with a code to identify him, not because rich men went, went about. Jackie is a beast of burden. His horse, the royalty rode, even in his day. So look at this. If we're going to say, for learn to distribute, for you know that when the Lord Jesus lived, he abounded so much that he distributed. This scripture makes sense. But what Paul said is, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That even though in true essence, he was rich. But for your sakes, he became poor. That means in the day of his manifestation, what you saw was a poor person. Oh. Aye. So you find out that Christ placed a demand on divine resources only when there was need. Because he was not constrained by the human system and yet he was not affluent by the human system. But he was for a purpose. He refused to be identified as rich. For your sake, he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, that means the essence of his becoming poor is so that he does not make you beggars. The only way you would have been able to ascend into his wealth is if he came and took you there. And as at the time when both of you arrived here, you seated with him in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. At that point, he was not on earth, you are. That means, he permitted the display of his wealth to be carried by you. Let me say the way you'll understand it. That means Christ lived poor. It's not an excuse to be poor. Just like he hid strength, just like he hid wisdom, he also hid riches. So that when you approach him, you will not approach him because of what you will get. But by the time he makes you, 
now that he knows that you know, you understand the essence of who he is, he can return so that you will display the riches. Now, so look at it. The moment he ascended on high, he released the church into a realm where the church can now have the right to the control of resource. Now, hear this. And in a season, the church actually worked in it. But as the church entered into it, it entered into it together with the dark ages. Because what happened was that men who were not made were now in control of resources. So the church became a financial gathering center. From the dark ages, it's not a charismatic problem. It's not Pentecostal's problem. That was what was called the dark ages. So the bishops controlled the resources. But when they did, what they did was that they defied they defiled or they became defiled by the power that came with riches. So everything about the church became the control of wealth. But hear this. It is not only coming back, it is back. And it is back in a dispensation of an incorruptible people. We say this to say that in honor of his poverty, I uh, So the way to honor his poverty is that you become rich. The problem with this verse of scripture is that you cannot interpret that rich outside of wealth. Because everything he was talking about was speaking about the distribution of the need of the saints. Give them the next verse so that they can see it. Verse 10. Look at this. For you know the grace of Allah who yet for your sakes became poor. And herein I give you my advice. That it's expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be. Eh? And herein I, I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be. That means I, I'm speaking to you guys because since one year ago you have been looking for opportunities to give. Next verse, verse 11, look at this. Now and therefore, perform what? So that as there was a willingness, there will also be a doing. Oh, I thought we spoke about that this evening. Uh, what's the distance between we? Faith. So what he's saying is, it is all right for you to exercise your faith and enter into the abundance that comes by knowing that Christ did an exchange for you so that you can now have enough to do. Is, is scripture clear? Okay, you have a question. Are you sure it's today? Very short question. The problem is whether the answer is short. Let me finish this thought. Then I'll consider that your short question. I'm coming, sir. Look at this. Is anybody getting it? I said to you, the problem with this verse of scripture, Pastor Ampi, is that the, the depth of your consecration cannot change the fact that it was speaking financially. It was speaking the ability to distribute. So there's no other interpretation for it except to say that in honor of the faith of Jesus, who became poor so that you can be wealthy, understand this by faith so that as there was a readiness to win, there can now be an ability to perform. Right? Let's add a few more verses. Just, just two more, two more, two more. Twelve. You don't finish. Two, two more now, two more. Twelve. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man had and not according to what he had not. That means you guys were already willing, but you were limited by how much you have. And if you understand the legality of the, the substitutionary work of Christ that should make you abound, then you will have more so you can do more. Next verse. For I mean, I, for I mean not that other men be eased and you be burdened. Oh, you can see it. But by an equality, 
now at this time of your abundance, sorry, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance may also be a supply for your want, that there may be what? That means I'm not saying that you that do, does not have you now squeeze what you do not have then you not now have because you are trying to share with brethren no but excuse me he had said in verse 1 that I testify that the, your poverty out of that poverty you gave and you gave not the way we expected you gave beyond how we expected so was Paul now condemning giving your last no, what he was saying is, if you don't honor the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, you will be squeezing your last. But in God's ultimate sight, he's not looking for how you'll be squeezing your last for others to be comfortable. He wants to bring you to the place where you understand this abundance so that every time you are giving, your excess is what is satisfying their need. Ayo, ayya. What do we say? What is God's ultimate plan? 2 Corinthians 9 8. We start from 2 Corinthians 8 9. See 2 Corinthians 9 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. First thing, so that you have all sufficiency. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Mama, hold this one. This is sufficient. That means at this level, everything he needs is supplied. Hold this. The bottle, bottle, bottle. Where can I bring the glass? Bring the glass. To... Bring the glass. Every glass. Thank you. Let's finish and multiply grace again. So I meet a brother. Drop the bottle. So they're not confused. I meet a brother. He lacks. Now, he has abundance, I lack. What Paul was saying is that there's a technology that can make that he has abundance. And you have abundance. When you understand that Christ, through his poverty, made you rich, what then happens is that you unveil the multiplied grace that makes that you now know that this thing is not about inconvenience yourself so that others can be it starts from there that's why I told you that Paul started by saying that the depth of their poverty abounded in their rich liberality that means as at when they started this is how they started and we saw the willingness of your righteousness to find expression to the degree to which even after your righteousness has found expression take now you are like this. You are still alright. But what we did is because we saw your heart in that state, we sent Titus to perfect you. So that every time you turn like this, you will turn back and you are still full. So that what you do is you engage the covenant of knowing that Christ died poor so that I can live rich. To know that every time I turn, I'm only providing space for him to heal. So there's no time I'm done doing a good work that I now lack. So God, take, give my bonus bottle. God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you having all sufficiency, this all sufficiency, all management. When he said might abound to every good work, you cannot abound from your sufficiency. So be pouring this water inside this one. Oh, you didn't see it. So learn the covenant that keeps your own resources flowing. Because I saw your heart. You have been willing more than a year ago. So it's important that I teach you what it takes for you to keep multiplying. Because in God's design, he's able to make all grace abound towards you. So if he takes from you, he does not reduce you. Take all of them away. At this point, if you don't understand, I cannot help you. So 
So you find out that actually one of the ways to provoke the wisdom of God to abundance is to have a heart that is willing to do and to begin to do when you are yet to abound. Oh, there's no other way we can say it. Do you understand this, sir? One of the ways to provoke abundance is to permit discontent every time you see a need. And don't wait until you have to begin to do. When you begin to do when you do not have, you will provoke revelation in your direction that will cause you to consistently have. So Paul said, we send Titus to you. Because may, maybe if you heard the Lord today, he'll have said to you, I sent Tende to you. I sent Chin talk to you. Because I saw the willingness of your heart and how that in your nothingness, you still squeeze your last 5K. So I said, let me send teachers who will pass by and teach you how that uh, the joy for me is not so that you lack and then others have. That's not the joy. It is so that your abundance will meet up their lack. Oh, tonight is not the time. I'll have shown you that that's the ordination for priesthood. So the priest lives like a big boy because the people have abounded. That's God's design. But there has to first be a willingness. So everywhere I see a need, I'm willing. I said in the prosperity conference, I think two years ago, I said, let me tell you something. Don't ever let a project pass without you registering your willingness even if it's 500 naira. I didn't say the 500 must be your last money every time. I say, you can't sit down and say, in my lifetime, I will build God a temple. Then we say, we are building a church for the children's unit. Then you will not say, because I have the vision of building God a temple. You see this, my 500. Let it be my token of faith that God registers my willingness to be a part of this. That's what the Bible says, that if there's a willingness, it is received according to what a man hath, not what he hath not. Did you get it? Did you get it? So now you understand that riches, strength, and wisdom are reserved to be the exclusive display of the church so that when our bridegroom comes we will salute him and say thank you for your victory it is by your victory that we present these in Raymond's words trophies of your blood amen does it make sense ah we're out of time tonight but let's bless the Lord let's bless the Lord I didn't want to go beyond it let's bless the Lord Father thank you Thank you for the release of your grace. We walk in strength. We walk in wisdom. We walk in riches. You perfect us in these things as we rise by faith. Oh, above and below me, before and behind me, in heaven. Eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, the Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, let Christ be all around me, oh.
Christ be all around me. As I rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As I wake, eyes of God, look upon, be my side. Be my sight above and below, before and behind, in every aisle of seas, Christ be all around me, above and below, before and behind, in every aisle of seas. Let Christ be all around me. Oh, oh, Christ be all around me. Oh, 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 Christ be all around me. Lord, let our lives be the fullness of the testimony of the workings of these things. Not many days from now, let our profiting appear to all men. We give you praise, Father. Receive these things by faith. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout, Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintok.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast. You can also follow live services on www.mixlr.com slash the GLAJ. Let our lives be the fullness of the testimony of the workings of these things. Not many days from now, let our profiting appear to all men. We give you praise, Father. Receive these things by faith. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout, Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintok.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast. You can also follow live services on www.mixlr.com slash The GLAJ.